Well, welcome again, dear friends, to uh, our teaching of the week in the electionary text. Um, this week, we look at one of the perhaps one of the most well healed passages in all of the Bible. Certainly, one of the most well known around the world. Uh, John chapter three, and perhaps the most famous verse in all the Bible, uh, John 3.16, For God loved the world so much that he gave his own one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What our Lord said to uh, the rabbi that came to him at night, Nicodemus. I have, I have taken this passage, John 3, 1 through 17, and given it the title, You Must Be Born Again. Uh, John 3.16 is just simply not known well in sort of biblical parlance and speaking around the world. Uh, but it's one of the favorite bumper stickers <laughs> that you've ever seen. Now, bumper stickers, I don't know if you like them or not, but bumper stickers are sort of amazing things. They're, they're usually these pithy, uh, powerful ideas that you, you put on, that's on a little, you know, four by 12 something. And, uh, it's, it's just, you know, for the person who backs up behind you. And it's usually like this. You can sort of tell, if you look and study a person's bumper stickers, you can sort of tell where their leanings are, politically, religiously, and so on. Uh, their, uh, John 3.16 is a favorite bumper sticker and billboard attraction of a lot of Christians. You know, this is, this is, uh, this is not, uh, Soft sell. <laughs> oh, whoever is driving this car wants you to understand that you're running out of time and you've got to do something about it. Uh, it it's, it's interesting. I've taken time to uh, look at bumper stickers and billboards like this is one of my favorite. You must be born again. You know, 855 fine truth. It's a, it's a billboard that's been up and, you know, it's sort of interesting. It's not very subtle. Uh, uh, for some reason, John 3.16 is a favorite of, of those who post stuff. And you can imagine that those who don't believe in the Bible or in Jesus Christ have done things to sort of take uh, John 3.16, Christian bumper sticker theology, and they've sort of turned it for their own benefit, as in this, this ictus symbol with Darwin in the center, a fish with feet, <laughs> uh, sort of a pro-evolution sort of scenario. Well, we have been born twice, uh, those of us who believe. Here is a, here's a cells thing, born two times. Uh, and it, it's an interesting idea, and I'd like to explore that today. The principle that I think we need to talk about is much larger than billboards or bumper stickers. John 3, 16, John chapter 3 goes to the heart of what we believe as, as Christians. And this is the thesis for this great text, John 3, 1 through 17. In order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Born from above, born from water, born from the Spirit. By the way, all of these illustrate a single rebirth. It's referred to in terms of being born from above, from water, or from the Spirit. So as we go through this text, uh, we'll see why we must be born again. We'll observe the facts. We'll, we'll find a principle uh, or two to uh, think about it. We will, we will interpret it carefully. And then based on that principle, we will then try to see how we can apply this and make this a part of our own life. Let's begin then with the facts here. Uh, what do we observe in John chapter 3? We begin, and I'm going to focus for the sake of my teaching on verses 1 through 8, which, which really sort of hunkers down on, nests upon the idea of being born again. 
Uh, John begins this amazing text with a visit from a rabbi to Jesus by night. He's a prominent rabbi and ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus, who comes to visit Jesus in the first and the second verse. John puts it this way. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with them. What a what a what an interesting sort of way to begin this conversation. Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a ruler uh, in in the people of God, comes to Jesus by night, which is filled with all sorts of intrigue. Uh, uh, there are there are traditions that says uh, Pharisees who were merchants. Um, many oftentimes business guys, they work during the day and they would go and discuss biblical things in the evenings. There are others who say that this by night could be a symbolic reference to, to, to the, the great theme that is covered in the book of John of light and darkness. You know, whatever it is, I think it's factual to say that this, this man, a ruler of the Jews came to Jesus a Pharisee, uh, who uh, Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a ruler, a rabbi, he came and, in fact, recognized this is Jesus' authenticity. No one can do the things you're doing unless God is with them. Well, that's the way it begins, this amazing scene. Well, Jesus responds to Nicodemus immediately with a challenge to be born again. He speaks of the necessity of the, of the new birth in verses three and four. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mama's womb and be born? <laughs> Nicodemus was kind of nonplussed at the whole idea. What, what, what is this? What gives on this? Well, Jesus establishes the, the tone of the conversation by saying unequivocally that no one can even see the kingdom of God unless they are born again a brand new rebirth. And Nicodemus fundamentally failed to comprehend the necessity. He translated it in terms of like physical rebirth. How can you, how can you be born again? You can't go back into your mama's womb and then pass through the birth canal again. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Can you please explain to me what you're talking about? It's like he took it, he took it either and it's hard to read in between the lines, the tone. Was he speaking sort of sarcastically? Oh, that's crazy. I mean, what tone do you adapt when you, when you read Nicodemus' failure? Is he saying, oh, that's impossible? Is he just genuinely so curious he can't make out what he's talking about? It's clear that he failed. Well, Jesus explained what he meant. He said, unless you're born of the word, born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Entering the kingdom means you are born of the water and of the spirit. I believe it's the same thing as being born again. So in verse five, Jesus will say, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Look at the words of Jesus carefully. He doubles down with, with Nicodemus. He didn't say, oh, you're right. You can't just go back into your mama's room. He insisted on this. Unless someone is in fact born of water, and I believe this is a citation regarding the scripture. Born of water and the work and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, why do I think that the water is an allusion to the word? James 1.18 says, of his own will, the father brought us forth. He gave birth to us by the word of truth. 
that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So I think there are some who said, it's, it, could this be water baptism? Could this be a symbolic rendering of just the washing of God with the blood of Christ with forgiveness? I think a better rendition is to see that water spoken of as the word of God that brings us forth, as James says, that we can be a kind of first fruits of God's new creation. He also said that you need to be born by the Holy Spirit. So I think this is a very clear illusion that is cited many, many times in the Old Testament, that the new birth, this new regeneration, this brand new us, the new insides, a brand new nature that God gives everyone who believes in Christ is effected in us by the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be, and be careful to obey my rules. The Ezekiel prophecy says God will put his spirit in us. And so instead of just natural sort of motivation to try to keep God's commandments based on our own strength, he would give us a brand new nature. We would be born anew inside by the Spirit and the Word. And we, and that Word and that Spirit would cause us to walk in His statutes and obey His rules. So this is very, very important. You must be born of the water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom. And the flesh and the Spirit are mutually exclusive. Look, there is no room in the Bible to say that you, unaided by God, without his grace, his mercy, his aid, his spirit, his word, there is no way you can please God or be spiritual or, or be saved by God. God must initiate it. He is the only one to give you the strength so you can be saved and so you can live holy. I love this text in John, Job 15 that sort of sums up the impossibility of the flesh to obey God. What is man that he can be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he can be righteous? What, what, what person who's born of a woman, the first birth, can be righteous? Behold, God puts no trust even in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. It's plain to this Job text and to Jesus that you must be born again. Simply doing the best you can is never enough. You need new, a new nature, a new mind, a new spirit, a new soul. Only God can give this. Only the Word and the Spirit can give this. You must be born again in order to relate to God. That's why Jesus can say in John 3, 7, don't be amazed at this. As a matter of fact, his next verse, he talks about a wind that blows wherever it wants. He describes the one who is born from above uh, as if there's a movement of the Holy Spirit inside that person. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is not something you can trace on your own, Jesus said. It's impossible to map the wind's movements. It goes wherever it wants to. It, it, it comes from places you can't map, and it goes to where it wishes. He said, everyone who's born of the Spirit is like that. Everyone who is born of the Spirit is like that. Okay, so... Where, how do we interpret this passage? This is the way I think we should read what Jesus said to Nicodemus. To be born from above through the word, through the water, the word, and the spirit is to be translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. And nobody can do this on their own. Only God can deliver you. Only God can save you. Only God can invest in you what you need in order to please him. 
Colossians 1.13 says he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. God delivered us. He delivered us from the domain of darkness. You must be born again. He must transfer you to the kingdom of his beloved son. Or as John 1, 12 and 13 renders this principle, this idea, but to all who did receive him, Jesus of Nazareth, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, not naturally, not of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. To those who believe, he gives the right to become his very own children. They are born anew. They are regenerated and become his own kids. So what's the principle that emerges from this then? To be born again, we must accept the love of God that he has provided for the world through the gift of his son. Later on in the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus, he makes his plain. And, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 3, 14 and 15. And here's the great text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I love what Billy Graham said on this. He said, a transformed life is not just a good human project. It's the greatest of all miracles. Every single time a person is born again by repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ, the miracle of regeneration is performed. God must do something in us that we simply cannot do for ourselves. No person can deliver themselves from the domain of darkness. And no person can be born again from above without this miracle of new life, regeneration being performed in their heart. So, dear friends, how do we make this truth of being born again our own? It's really simple. We must be born from above through faith in Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Recall what Jesus said. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. We are born from above when we place our faith in Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God, and God then makes us an heir of eternal life. We are born from above, born of water, born of the Spirit, and we receive life eternal, the hope of life eternal. Titus, Paul put it to, to Titus in the third chapter this way. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, there it is again, of new birth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being made righteous, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We become heirs. Guys, we become his kids. We become kinfolk with God and all his people when we believe. A.W. Tozer put it in his wonderful little book, The Pursuit of God. The moment the Spirit has quickened us to life and re in regeneration, our whole being senses its kinship to God. We become his kids and leaps up in joyous recognition. This is the heavenly birth without which we cannot see the kingdom of God. Dear friends, there's a family likeness to those who belong to the same family. <laughs> we become like God. We share his nature and, all, and we share the same with all of those who share it together. We become God's kinfolk. It's not just keeping external commands. We share his very nature together. In order to enter the kingdom of God, we must be born again by faith in Jesus from above, 
from water and by the Spirit. Next time you look at a, a bumper sticker, maybe one that has John 3.16 on it, where you must be born again, remember this great truth. In order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Your own natural talent and ability and conscience and intellect won't do. You must be born from above by the water and washing of the word, by his Holy Spirit. And he will make you his very own baby, a brand new you, a child of the Father. Dear friends, I trust that you will be born again, that you will trust in Jesus of Nazareth, and by faith, you will become brand new. It's a gift to all of us, and to you. Amen.